we have to take this all the way back. If you look at the data, I have a really nice chart. If you believe the CDC, if, if the CDC has any credibility anymore, I, I don't know that they do. But when these data first started being collected on body mass index back in the early 1960s, the average American man was about 10 percent uh, obese, according, again, according to BMI. And we know BMI is not perfect, but it's still a very good, quick and dirty indicator. And women were about 14, 15 percent obese. This was between 60 and 62. And then the last data that CD, CDC has up until I think it's 2018, uh, men are now obese at about a 43 percent rate and it's about 42 percent of women. Hello, my friend, and welcome to Something for Everybody. My name is Aaron Mashpitz. Dr. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, everyone, for having me. I look forward to our conversation today. Absolutely. First and most important question, John, how are you doing? Like, actually, for real, how are you doing? For real? I'm, I'm doing really well. I'm, I'm you know, I, I live day by day. That's my motto. I don't really think too far ahead in the future, and I try not to think too far back in the past. I just try to take each day as it comes at me with what I have to do every day to be successful or make progress. And, uh, and that includes my, how I eat, how I supplement, how I exercise, how I take care of myself. For me, that's my number one priority. And then everything else kind of falls below that, but, but, uh, I'm doing well. Has your, has your mindset about life always been like that? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> I'm, I'm like everybody else. I'm a work in progress and, I don't consider myself anywhere near a finished product, but I did, you know, you go through life where you have relationships with girlfriends or you have relationships with business partners or other colleagues. And, you know, sometimes you get stabbed in the back or you get treated a way you didn't feel like you should have been treated. And so you have to learn from those experiences. Otherwise you end up repeating them if you don't. And so again, I'm a work in progress, but I, I feel much better about where I am today in terms of my approach to life than I did, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. Definitely. I used to get, I used to, you know, get angry and hold grudges and, and be really uh, upset about things. And today I just feel like somebody does me wrong. I'll, I'll pay enough attention to it as much as I need to. And then as soon as I do some self coaching, I'm done with it and I move on. Yeah. I mean, when you when you say it out loud, right? Logically, it sounds like that we should all be doing that, <laughs> but uh, it just it just takes it just takes so long to figure it out, right? And it's like I always think about this uh, in terms of like a personal development space. Like, do we do we actually grow, or do we just get more mature and experience more things? Or are those two the same thing? Like, are we actually growing, or are we just like living more life? Maybe they're the same. Maybe there's not big of a difference. But I'm like, now I'm 31. Like I think about myself at 22, I'm about to get married. If I was thinking about marriage at 22, it would have freaking blown my mind, <laughs> you know? So I don't know if it's just experience, maturity, maybe it's the addition of growth. I don't know. Maybe it's all of them combined, but uh, yeah, anyways. <laughs> it's a great point. I don't know if I have an answer. I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think it just kind of all gets, you know, lumped together in this big soup of our lives and uh, and we just have to deal with it as best as we can as we move forward and hopefully we do self-evaluate. I think self-evaluation is very important. You can listen to feedback from other people, but you still at the end of the day, you have to, you know, you have to look at yourself honestly and as objectively as you can. I, I think it's sort of analogous to being a parent. We have a, my wife and I have a now a four-year-old. She just turned four a few weeks ago and it's like you can hear all the advice in the world about other people who have already had a child or children, but until you actually do it yourself, it's very difficult to really truly understand what other people are telling you because you have to live it. You have to experience mm -hmm. that child's stubbornness or defiance or mood swing or whatever it is that uh, happens. And then you have to do deal with it the best you can. You can't, I mean, you're, parents, your grandparents, your best friend, whoever can tell you all day long what they did. But at the end of the day, it still comes down to what you decide to do. 100%. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I think about having kids. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to read some books and I'm gonna do some stuff. But based on what my friends tell me and what you just said, it's like, I don't know, I don't, it's going to be a whirlwind, no matter what, how many inf right. inf information I have. So, uh, <laughs> but excited for that chapter. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> but not to sidetrack us a little bit, but that was good uh, to get sort of back on the, the main topic. Um, the first question I want to ask you is, why do you think as a society we've become so overweight and why is that still trending upward? Oh, gosh, what a great question, Aaron. I think it, you, we have to take this all the way back. If you look at the data, I have a really nice chart. If you believe the CDC, if, if the CDC has any credibility anymore, I, I don't know that they do. But when these data first started being collected on body mass index back in the early 1960s, the average American man was about 10 percent uh, obese. Accor again, according to BMI, and we know BMI is not perfect, but it's still a very good, quick and dirty indicator. And women were about 14, 15 percent obese. This was between 60 and 62. And then the last data that CD, CDC has up until I think it's 2018, uh, men are now obese at about a 43 percent rate and it's about 42 percent of women. And so that we're talking not even what a half a century. This has all shifted where, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, even up into the 70s, you didn't even really see that many obese people. Now, everywhere you look, it's like it's a it's the United States of the obese. I mean, it's just shocking. So. I say all that context to answer your question to say, I think it's a couple of things. One, clearly fast food. I mean, if you look at, you know, the true evil empire, McDonald's, that started all of this uh, deterioration of food, that came into being in the late 50s, early 60s, and it trends, you know, the rise in fast food restaurants, literally, you know, it's just almost a perfect linear correlation with what's happened to us, not only in terms of obesity, but all these other chronic diseases. And then, of course, you know, the so-called green revolution that we implemented into agricultural farming. I mean, at the turn of the 20th century, it was something like 95 percent of Americans were somehow involved in some form of agriculture. Now, today, it's less than one percent of our population. So it's all these large corporate farms. You know, the small mom and pops have almost been driven out of business. And of course, I don't I mean, we have a, we have a few mango trees and we've got a couple of other little plants here and there that we get some stuff from, but we, we certainly don't have a garden. I don't know. I literally do not know one person who has a garden. I mean, it's just completely, our entire society has completely shifted and changed the way we grow our food and how we consume our food. And so I think this green revolution where we had all of these, you know, the, the pesticides, the herbicides, and then a little bit later, we had the genetic modification of our foods on top of that. All of these chemical genetic inputs that have been introduced into our foods in the last 50 years. And then of course you can't ignore the aspect of technology. I mean, as, mm -hmm. as people were also growing their own food, what were they doing? They were waking up at the crack of dawn, getting out into their own garden or farm and man, they were working. I mean, they were, that was hard labor and it didn't matter who you were, unless again, you were a banker or, you know, somebody else in a store, but, most of us would have been, you know, you and I wouldn't even be having this conversation a hundred years ago. We'd be out in our cornfield, you know, growing, you know, doing what we needed to do to make sure we had a crop to eat. And so <clears throat> when you combine all of these shifts, man, it's no wonder people are so obese. And then take it, take it one step further. I think it's like 75% of Americans are now on at least one medication. Mind boggling. And I think there's like 40, 50% who are taking at least four medications. So <clears throat> we're getting sick. What do we do? We go to a physician who then throws us a prescription and we take that prescription. It doesn't really work. We take another prescription because now we have more side effects, not only from the original condition, but the side effects of the first medication. And then that polypharmacy starts building this just gigantic, enormous, nasty, pyramid of all of these effects and and no one knows the answers to polypharmacy polypharmacy is absolutely not studied and so you have no idea the interaction of all these different classes of drugs to try to address whether it's diabetes or hypertension or lipid dyslipidemia depression anxiety you know all these different things asthma all these different things that people are plagued with today that they weren't plagued with a hundred years ago my god no wonder 40 something percent of Americans are obese today. It's, it's just staggering. And I don't know where yeah. we go. I mean, it, I, you know, it's like, I think of it, 
like from from my own perspective, I mean, and maybe people would think I'm being too hard or my opinion is too rough, but I think everything in life for the most part still comes down to personal responsibility. Unless you're underage, you're a minor, or unless you are demented or you you have down syndrome or you know, you're severely autistic, something that prevents you from being an independent functioning person, everything comes down to personal responsibility and that includes your health because if you're not taking care of your health, not only are you impairing your own quality of life, but then when you add that up, you know, by the thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, all the way up to our entire population, now we're contributing to a very sick society that can't function properly. I mean, you know, look at some of the things that you hear from like the military. I mean, the army now can't even accept. There are so many people that try to get into the military and they can't even pass the uh, the initial physical examination because they can't they can't run a mile or in so much time. They can't do so many push ups or sit ups or pull ups. So all these basic functions that humans used to be able to do, mostly men, you know, 50 years ago, now they can't even do it. I mean, it's like just the, it, it reminds me so much of that movie, Idiocracy. And, you know, it's like people were sitting around like fat, fat globs of goo. They couldn't do anything other than just watch video games and eat. And that's what we're becoming. I mean, it's really sad that that movie actually was like a sort of a portending of the future. You know what shoes they were wearing in that movie, John? I don't remember. Crocs. <laughs> I'm not surprised, right? And the whole point of that the whole point of that movie was to show like this is what could potentially happen. And and so weird that it is exactly how we went in this road. Um It's unreal. Yeah. And so where do you think based on all that, where do you think sort of like money plays a part in everything? How how much do you think it plays a role in you know people's lives and whether it's their own money or someone giving money to something else to make it advertising, marketing, whatever the case may be, just just, just money overall, where is that playing a part? Well, you, are you talking about lobbying specifically, like the grip that Big Pharma basically has not only on our government, but also on TV advertising? I, I yeah, let's start there. Right, I read a, a statistic the other day, Big Pharma pays something like 75% of all TV advertising today. It's crazy. You cannot watch a show on TV without seeing two or three advertisements for drugs. And then of course, some other advertisement is gonna be the law firm that is asking you if you've taken this drug and if you've had side effects or if you died from it, give us a call because we'll help you get uh, you know, some money back. So you're absolutely right. I mean, we have such a, uh, again, a nasty incestuous relationship between industry and government, and then how, if you're an unsuspecting, non-thinking person, you just kind of go along with this rigmarole. You don't even think, well, wait a minute, am I hearing information that's to my benefit, or am I hearing information to my detriment? It's kind of like what Bill Maher said. The, uh, uh, I think this was back when, this was about 15 years ago. I forget which presidential election this was, but I know Hillary Clinton was running, but it was before, um, before Trump got involved. So this must have been like early 2000s. And on Mars show, whether you like him or not, I mean, I don't agree with everything the guy says, but I think he does make some good points. And on one of his shows, he made such a great point where he said, there's no money in dead people. There's no money in healthy people. You got to be in between. And that's what Big Pharma is shooting for. Everybody needs to be on, you know, again, two, three, four, five or more medications. When my grandmother died, and this is going all the way back to 2000 when she died, bless her heart, she was on 13 medications. I was so angry <clears throat> when I saw, and I, she was in Tennessee, I was in Miami. And when I saw all these medications, my grandmother was taking it at the time of her death. I thought, man, all of these physicians that have done this to her, they should be dro driven out of business for malpractice because she was just going to one specialist after another and each one would give her another drug, not even considering all the damage that they were doing to her. Again, going back to polypharmacy, and she was just, you know, one of these unsuspecting souls that if somebody had a white co coat on and had doctor before his or her name, well, that's, you know, coming like from the Bible or, you know, straight from the, the word of God or something. But yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, money is so important in all this. And again, going back to how big pharma just has such a grip on lobbying to our government, <clears throat> this revolving door there is between big pharma and FDA. 
I mean, people keep going back and forth. You get somebody in FDA in a big muckety muck position and they help write all this legislation that gets sent to Congress that then Congress then passes and then approves some legislation that benefits big pharma. And then they go back and forth. They take a, they leave FDA and then they take a board job with some big pharma company. I mean, it's absolutely insane. Look at what happened with um, the passage of the, um, I forget what that exact act is called. It was signed in 1986. It basically gives all the pharmaceutical companies immunity from uh, vaccine injury and death. And it was signed in 1986. I know Kennedy, RFK Jr., he talks a lot about this on his campaign trail, but that law needs to be rescinded. Like there are, there are laws on the books that favor FDA going all the way back to, I think it's the Drug, Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act of 1938, I think. That is still on the books where it prevents people like us in health and wellness and me specifically in nutrition being able to talk about certain things in nutrition. Otherwise, we can be accused of talking about nutrition treating disease, which is a just total nonsense. That law should be rescinded, just like the law from 1986. We have to have a shift in all of this legislation that loads the power for the big pharmaceutical industry and even big food, I'd say to a lesser degree than big pharma, but in a way that shifts some of this power and balance back to the, back to the individual. I mean, it's just completely out of whack at this point. Yeah. But I mean, I, I tend to think like back to the point you made about personal responsibility, there's just so much information out there now that y there's sort of no excuse to go into a situation or take something or do something yeah. that you don't have full information about. Because Agreed. yes, I know going to physicians and doctors and all this stuff costs money, but the amount of podcasts that are out there that cost $0 that explain almost every single drug that might be on the market or supplements that might be good. Like your podcast, Peter Atia goes over all this information. Like all of these things are available. Now I know it's hard work and it takes time and effort, but this is your life we're talking about. You don't like, you don't, you don't get another chance. Like this no dress rehearsal to the, to life, right? If you, if you actively are caring about the person you are, who you want to be, the role model you might be for your children, you can take an hour or two to think about what you might be doing. And it's always, it's always so reactive. Instead, we got to get to the point where we're proactive. Like, what are my most basic fundamentals that I have to dial in about my health? You talk about them, right? Nutrition, movement, supplements, like eating well, moving well, sleeping well, thinking well. Cool. Those are dialed in to my absolute best of my ability. And now I'm still not feeling great or something's still wrong. Okay. What can we address from that point? Now I can see someone who's a specialist in this area or I can take different supplements or I can do some blood testing or whatever the case may be. But it's always just this like, okay, here's a magic bullet. You're good. Move on. You don't have to do anything else from there. At least from my eyes, who's someone who's not a doctor, not in the medical field at all. That's what I see. I totally agree with you. And, and again, I, excuse me, I was not, you know, sort of going off on my little soapbox to to excuse people in their in their inability. Oh, no, to I know for sure. I, I totally agree with you. Again, if you talk about priorities, we obviously need money to function in society. There's no there's no getting around that. But beyond just, you know, working and having what you would hope to be a decent life and in terms of your career and, you know, having satisfaction in what you want to do, quite frankly, your health is your number one uh, characteristic in this life. Right. I mean, of course, you have time and you have your health and we can't do anything about the passage of time. There's no cure for mortality, I don't think. And uh, so we have to do the best we can in that amount of time. And I don't care if you're a billionaire. I don't care how many cars you have, how many homes you have, whatever. If you're sick, if you cannot do anything with all your money, with all your toys, what does it even matter? So I totally agree with you. I mean, everybody. And that's, again, you know, circling this idea all the way back to the beginning about personal responsibility is that includes being informed. I mean, my dad, bless it, you know, God rest his soul. My dad used to say all the time, you know, don't be ignorant and especially don't be willfully ignorant. I mean, that's like the worst thing you can do to yourself is just sort of walking around like ignorance is bliss and everything's just going to work it out for itself. No, that's complete baloney. Like you have to be informed. You have to know what you're doing. And to your point, when it comes to your health, you have to take charge of it. I tell people all the time, don't give away your power to somebody with a white lab coat on. You have the power. It's your body. Do what you think is best for you 
But that starts with informing yourself, not just listening to, you know, some hack that doesn't know is, you know, what from a hole in the ground. Right. I mean, it comes down to like any other decision, like people ask me all the time, well, how do I know which dietary supplement to take? Well, besides recommending my own, I would say it's like any other decision. You wouldn't just show up to a Toyota dealership and just say, oh, here, that car over there looks really pretty. I'm going to buy that one. No, you would do some homework first. You'd you'd look into consumer reports. You'd look for reviews. You'd look how many cars get recalled. You'd look you'd do some actual homework to decide, OK, this is the most reliable car, the best car that I can get for what I can afford today. Same thing with dietary supplements. Look at which companies are involved in research. Look, look at which companies actually have, you know, the backing to stand behind what they sell and they haven't been sent FTC or FDA warning letters because they are, are trying to be shysters and, and rip people off. I mean, it's the exact same analogy. Yeah. The, the, I've shared this quote a few times on this podcast, but maybe you've heard it. It's the, it's, it, it suits this so well. The quote is, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And I think that that stamps it like, cause, cause we're all doing the same thing. Okay. Everyone's tired at 4 PM. Well, I, I'm not, I don't think you're tired at 4 PM, John, right? Well, like, I mean, I feel good. My body feels good. I can move around. I played pickleball yesterday. I'm going to go do jitsu. I've coached, you know, all these sorts of things. Cause I'm, I'm not well adjusted. It's like a rebellious act to take care of ourselves. And so just because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean you and I have to, right? It all goes back to the same concept of agency. We have agency. That's why we're the, the most special creatures on this planet because we have power to think and act for ourselves. And you have to do that because it is a rebellious act to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I am going to take care of myself. I'm going to try to prioritize the things that I eat and I'm going to think about the things that I put into my mouth. And with that, my next question is, what are the what are the maybe the most important things we can be eating to impact our brain health? Well, this is a great question, too. Well, if you want to talk about my dietary supplement research, we can do that. I don't know if you'd prefer to focus on foods first, but, you know, it, it's Either interesting. Way. OK, well, it's interesting when you think of the brain. I mean, I think the brain has kind of been even though. Obviously, without our brain, we are not us, but the brain from a research perspective, you know, at like the national level at NIH level has kind of been uh, not prioritized the way different things like cancer and heart disease, uh, diabetes, HIV historically over the last, say, 30, 40 years have been. But finally, we we're now putting more money into brain health because of all this neurodegeneration that's hitting us in doing at least in some part due to us living longer. But but then what do you do about it, right? Like, so the brain really, I mean, it's its first nutrition, nutrient, like every cell in the body is oxygen, of course. But the brain wants to, like most every other cell, it wants to consume glucose first, right? I mean, that's our that's our primary uh, blood sugar. But, but anyway, I, you know, specific foods, I mean, obviously things that are high in omegas like uh, walnuts. Walnuts is, is certainly a, a good food that's been studied. Uh, for its effects on brain health, cauliflower, broccoli. I mean, some of the typical things like that that you think of, again, maybe more in the aspect of um, preventing heart disease or cancer. But these these phytochemicals and these vitamins and minerals are, are very profoundly effective for the brain, too. But in our case, my colleagues and I, what we've what we've shown for almost the last two decades from the University of Miami at, at our lab is that these particular polysaccharides we've studied from aloe vera and rice bran man, I'd put these Aaron up against just anything else out there. And, and you can't really get these from food though. I mean, for example, I'll ask you a question. Do you know anybody who eats aloe vera? Like I don't, <laughs> you know, aloe, aloe, vera is not, <laughs> aloe vera is not a food that you normally consume. You, I mean, we have some growing in our backyard, but we never, um, you know, we never go out there and like snip the leaves and, you know, suck down some gel. I mean, it just, it's not a thing that people do. And then of course, Rice bran. The interesting thing about rice is that um, about about 70, 80 percent of the rice that's sold in the world is the white rice, just the big white endosperm that's left over when the when the rice is pulled in from the mill. It's you know, it's it's farmed, it's it's harvested, it's taken to the mill and then it starts the uh, the processing process. So the first thing, of course, is the hull or the husk, the out, you know, the outside that gets stripped off first. We can't consume that. The next big layer is the bran, and unfortunately, that's that gets stripped off, and then that's either thrown away or fed to livestock. 
So we're actually, in terms of the most beneficial part of the rice, what this amazing plant that Mother Nature gives us, we're actually either throwing it away or feeding it to livestock animals. So humans are not even taking advantage of the most important nutritious part of rice. But our research, I mean, again, if you want to talk just very briefly about what we've shown in, in both Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis, two of the three leading neurodegenerative disorders, the other one being Parkinson's, of course, is just incredible. I mean, in, for example, in our Alzheimer's research, we've shown in response to this allopolysaccharide rice bran complex with a few other things added to it that over a 12-month period, we showed statistically and clinically significant improvements in cognitive functioning in people with moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. That's unheard wow. of. That yeah. is unheard of. I mean, you can compare that to the five FDA approved drugs for dementia, any type of diet, any other type of dietary supplement, hyperbaric oxygen, acupuncture, music therapy. I mean, just, I would even ask any of your listeners, you tell me something, come back to me and say, hey, Lewis, guess what? I found this study showing something similar or better than what you guys showed. I have yet to see it. That first paper was published in 2013 and I didn't see anything in the, in the couple of years prior to us publishing that paper nor have I seen anything in the last 11 years uh, compared to that paper. So when you, can, when you can give these polysaccharides to the body, especially for somebody with a really serious issue like Alzheimer's, and oh, by the way, speaking of FTC and FDA, let me be very clear here. I wanna make sure no one ever accuses me of saying that I'm talking about using nutrition to treat disease. What I am referring to is providing the raw materials that every cell in our in our body, all 30 plus trillion cells, need to function properly. And of course, those include the ones in the brain. So this is not the pharmacolog pharmacological model where Big Pharma takes one chemical and they wanna look at very a very specific metabolic pathway to see if they can somehow manipulate that or alter it so that they can affect a symptom of a disease or a disease. That's pharmacology. That is not nutritional science. Nutritional science enables our physiology. We need oxygen, we need vitamins, we need minerals, we need all these other nutrients. And that's what allows our cells to function properly. And that is a far different model and a far different paradigm from big pharma. And so when you provide the raw materials that a cell needs to function properly, now the cell can actually do what it was supposed to do and in this case, what it wants to do is return to homeostasis, return different parameters, whether it's, in our case, <clears throat> inflammation. A lot of this story is related to, of course, inflammation, better immune function, improving adult stem cell uh, production. These are other things that we showed in our research that support. You have the, on the clinical practical side, this change in cognitive function. How do you explain that mechanistically or at the cellular level? So again, we showed an improvement in, in immune function according to the CD4, CD8 ratio. We lowered inflammation according to TNF-alpha and VEGF. Those two proteins are commonly looked at in heart disease and cancer. We're probably the first paper that also ever published anything like that in people with Alzheimer's. And then we also showed an increase in adult stem cell production according to CD14 cells, just under 300% over that. It was a 12-month intervention from baseline to 12 months. So these, <clears throat> all these effects are very powerful and very supportive of how these people were able to start thinking again, to start actually having some level of cognitive awareness, recalling memory, being able to understand where they were again, being able to, to recognize people again. All these different things that they had happened to them were supported by all these cellular changes. So that is profoundly powerful. And I would put up, again, without sounding like an egomaniac, I would put up our research against just about anything else out there when it comes to the ability of these polysaccharides to have such a profound effect on human functioning. I mean, you will not see that from amino acids, proteins, fatty acids, fats, vitamins, minerals, anything else. There's literally nothing else out there compared to that. So why, why do you think that, I mean, you're, the product you're talking about, right, is the, is the daily, daily brain care. Why, why do yeah. you think that all, every other doctor that you know, uh, every other person you know, all these other places, supplement companies are not promoting this same type of thing. Like, why would that not be the case? <clears throat> well, of course, you know, there's there's a 
I mean, our research is is proprietary in the sense that we conducted it, and then Daily Brain Care was the uh, the outcome of of this work. And so, I mean, we have a, a proprietary formula, of course, that we created from all this work. And again, it it was supported also by the the multiple sclerosis work as well. But I think polysaccharides are, you know, in general, something that most people don't know. I mean, part of the reason I'm, you know, here on your show today and and uh, a lot of the other work that I've done is to help people understand the value of polysaccharides. I mean, I think one of the things that one of the problems, Aaron, is that I could have said complex sugar, but I'm sure you know as well as I do, the word sugar is so negatively considered by most people going back, you know, again, for the last few decades, even before you were born, people have associated this word sugar with being bad. Like you hear the word sugar and just because of all this information or even propaganda in some cases in the mass media, media, you think sugar is bad. You don't even consider that Mother Nature actually has created many different types of sugars. And so there are certain characteristics that make a sugar not a sugar. And I think the two most important ones are, number one, the source. And then number two, it's, it's chemical complexity. So you have monosaccharides, the simplest form like high fructose corn syrup that obviously comes from corn that's very processed into a sweetener that causes your insulin to spike. It causes your glucose to spike. It does, you know, bad things for you. And I would obviously encourage people not to, to consume high fructose corn syrup. Then you have disaccharides like sucrose. They're a little bit more complex <clears throat> than monosaccharides. And then the most complex ones are, again, these polysaccharides that are even hundreds of different glucose units strung together or attached together by these very complex bonds, and they contain more coded information than any amino acid or any fatty acid. So when you look at the complexity of different things, obviously vitamins and minerals are pretty simple. Elements, of course, are even more simple than those. But these polysaccharides, man, they're so dense with information. And so take that a step further. When we put something into our mouth or when something goes through us, through the dermis, through our skin, what happens? Well, one of the things that happens is that our genes have the ability through our body's inherent intelligence to look at that information and say, okay, what do I do with this? The cells don't actually, the genes don't do anything until they receive information from the environment. And of course, the most significant way they do that is through our food and our drink. So when we consume something, the genes recognize it. They then, based on that information, tell the cells what to do. Now, if we're doing things to ourselves, uh, you know, we're eating, say, for example, a lot of, uh, I don't know what's a, the best example that I always think of is uh, barbecue or, you know, some grilled red meat, which is clearly not good for us. That grilled meat contains all of this uh, transformed fatty acids that are very carcinogenic. And over time, your DNA can start to form addicts in it, which are the preliminary steps to ending up with cancer, usually in the colorectum because of where all this occurs. And so the genes don't do anything until they recognize this information. And then they tell our, and then they, they tell our cells what to do. So circling this all the way back to one of my original comments about, or one of my earlier comments about how <clears throat> the cells want to be in homeostasis. When you provide the cells the information that they're looking for to function properly and within the cell itself. So we have organelles in the cell. So there's the mitochondria, which probably a lot of people have heard of, and that's our engine. That's our powerhouse for our cell. It creates energy. But there are two other very important or organelles that are not talked about as much. And those are the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi. And those organelles are responsible for constructing all these different compounds, elements that they receive and then creating bioactive compounds that then become some other step typically involved with the immune system, with the adult stem cell process, re, re, um, recreating us every day, each cell recreating itself. But these bioactive compounds require certain units of these polysaccharides to do their jobs properly. And so that is very crucial. Now, the body has the ability to take high fructose corn syrup, fructose, glucose, sucrose, some of these other more common sugars, and combine all of those things together into that polysaccharide that it needs. But clearly that does not work because of what our research, and, and not just from our lab, I mean, this is going on around the world in other labs as well, looking at things like 
not only aloe vera and rice bran, but other things like different types of mushrooms, uh, different types of seaweeds. These also are very um, significantly composed of different polysaccharides as well. But again, when you give the body directly these particular polysaccharides, it's like, say, for example, you have an old car that's got a lot of miles on it. It hasn't been running well. It's got water in the gas tank. Well, if you clear all the, the water out of the gas tank and you start using high test gasoline and it starts, you know, you do some other things to help freshen it up a bit. Now it, start, it starts running like a new car again. I know that's not mm -hmm. the greatest analogy in the world, but it's kind of the same thing. If you've been feeding yourself, you know, it's like the, it's like the old statistical analogy, garbage in, garbage out when it comes to data. Same thing with our cells. If we're not feeding our cells really good nutritional quality, they degrade over time. And they're going to do that anyway, just due to aging and the effects of inflammation and oxidation. Again, there's no cure for mortality. But we increase that rate of degradation if we don't take care of ourselves, again, primarily through nutrition, but movement and other things. But then if you have the ability to say, wait a minute, let me start feeding myself properly again, including these polysaccharides into the diet that I would argue maybe 100 years ago, our ancestors were getting more of those polysaccharides because, again, they were growing their own food. They didn't have it genetically modified. They weren't loading up their soil with all these pesticides and herbicides. So the food was actually more nutritious back then. But today, this is where I would also argue that these types of, of supplements like daily brain care can actually make a very, a very big difference, not only because of the poor quality of food today, but also because you don't get these polysaccharides in the diet. And so again, when you introduce these polysaccharides into your diet, taking them every day, it's again, almost like energizing your cells in a way that they probably have never even lived before if you didn't have any uh, ability or if you didn't have any knowledge about, you know, what these things could potentially do. So I, I know that's a very long winded answer to your question, but it's just it's very profound when you give these polysaccharides to someone, especially someone who's in a very serious health challenge situation, because it's now turning on functions that the cell was not able to do properly. And again, that leads back ultimately to trying to, to, to return to homeostasis. Yeah. Well, John, on this podcast, we love all the most long winded answers possible. So thank you. <laughs> oh, <great. laughs> yeah. Uh, especially when it's very complicated, the longer and more you go, the, the better we understand me and the listeners included. So thank right. you for that. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I was I, thinking about sugar as, as you started there, like I've heard numerous people say that we should be no, we should no longer be eating fruit because just like the fructose and the sugar is just the ruining everything like that just like that sounded to me like that just can't be true. <laughs> like that just can't that just can't be true. Like people have been eating things that grow from the ground for forever. Uh and so like if I eat 17 bags of gummies, yeah, that sugar is not good for me. <laughs> right? You know? So like but it's just so it's just so interesting. You know what I mean? Agreed. I, I mean, and I the other I don't I don't know if you want to talk about this any in your in the rest of our discussion, but I've been eating a plant based diet for twenty seven years. So you can imagine yep. my view of the folks that are going down this carnivore path to your point, you know, they're basically saying, Oh, all fruits bad, all veggies are bad, all grains are bad. I, I just find that whole that whole belief to just be so preposterous. It's not it's not if we ever had to be completely carnivore, we wouldn't have made it. There's no way humans would not be here today if we were always carnivore. I, I, I find that completely preposterous. Yeah, I, I stumbled upon. Uh, I don't know who shared this, but I, I found it a long time ago. These three eating rules. Uh, and this is what like I sort of try and live my life by. Let me know what you think of this. So rule number one is don't drink your sugar. Okay, cool. Rule number two is uh, eat more real food. And number three is uh, eat enough, but not too much. Those are the three rules. I was like, wow, that makes like a lot of sense. What do you think about those? I completely agree with you. I, I think that at least the last one was definitely from Michael Pollan's The Omnivore's, Omnivore's Dilemma. I don't know if that, you read that. That might be where I got it from, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, that's Michael Pollan's quote. I don't know about the first two, but I know the third one definitely is. And I... I would tend to agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, there's something to be said about processing. Again, processing is another another word, kind of like sugar. I think you have to take processing into context. Like, 
I had, even though I'm not doing it daily like I used to, for about 25 years, I started my day every day with my Vitamix blender. I, I would blend up a bunch of different things, uh, some combination of leafy greens with nuts and seeds and fruits. Well, that's processed. I mean, you know, a blending, you know, that's, that's, that's some level of processing. Same thing with chicken. You know, I, it drives me nuts when I hear people talk about chicken being a clean food. What does that mean? Those chickens were probably genetically modified on some level. They had probably some sort of acid or some other chemical uh, sprayed on them when they were, you know, finally butchered apart and then, you know, ready to be shipped to, um, you know, some distribution center before they went to a store. They probably were fed genetically modified food their entire life. They were probably injected with drugs to keep them from getting illnesses and infections. So what the heck is clean about that? I mean, that's just because you're seeing a chicken breast that looks like it was part of that animal, but it didn't, you know, it didn't go through some mixing or blending. or That doesn't mean it's clean. It still had all this genetic modification and pharmaceutical inputs into it. Tell me how that's clean. So I think, you know, it's important to be clear, like, and I actually, if I may, I want to go back to sugar just one more point because you reminded me of something I failed to mention. And that is for me as a scientist, I mean, I and I don't claim to be, you know, the mecca of all knowledge with running, uh, you know, scientific studies, although I, I think I am pretty knowledgeable. But I think it's so important for us to use our language properly, like, and especially in today's day and age of, you know, texting and social media where no one has attention span and people are using emojis and you know, uh, instead of Y-O-U, it's you and all these other things that kind of drive me nuts. But that's probably just, again, my own preferences for, you know, being very clear with the language. But we have to be very clear about things like sugar and processing and clean, because at the end of the day, our language means something. And especially in, you know, in my what I do with with polysaccharides and sugar, if you just say all sugar is bad, you are being you are being very ignorant and you are throwing the baby out with the bathwater and you need to educate yourself. And the same thing with, you know, those three points uh, of pollens. I mean, I think they're very it's, they're very good because they help the person that's not at our level. You know, people like you and me thinking about health, thinking about wellness and how we can achieve it. And so getting somebody as as a psychologist says, the teachable moment, whatever that happens to be when. Maybe somebody comes back. I mean, a good friend of mine was just telling me yesterday that or two days ago that uh, her physician told her that she's now pre-diabetic and I've been working with her for a while trying to get her to change her diet. She is taking daily brain care. She's had a good response there, but now I want her to increase the dose. But those teachable moments where you can give people very simple guidelines, if not rules to follow to help them go from the, the Procrasca, Pro, Prochaska, I'm sorry, stages of change model to pre pre contemplation to contemplation to action if you can get people from that contemplation to action stage that's where the change really occurs and that's where hopefully they can be sustainable when they start doing things and they start seeing results and they start seeing their body respond to that and that is also the beauty of this machine that we call this body it will respond to the stimulus that you provide it good or bad right i mean you provided the bad ones, you become obese and diabetic and get cancer and Alzheimer's and heart disease. And then you die an early, ugly death. You give it the good food. You move it every day. You manage your stress. You sleep well. You don't smoke. You don't use tobacco or uh, you don't use alcohol or you use very little of it. And you can live a good, long quality of life. I mean, look at Jack LaLanne. I don't know how many people like, especially in your generation or certainly even younger, even know or appreciate that man. But that dude lived to be I think 93 or 94, he was up until the last two weeks of his life. He died of a lung infection, but he was still swimming like a mile. I don't know if it was daily or how often, but the dude was like, man, what an inspiration he was. Maybe he did steroids at some point in his life. He was pretty big at one point. I don't know if he did. I've never heard him being accused of being, you know, like a Schwarzenegger type. But I mean, what an amazing guy that was who was like such a model of you know, for fitness, like from the 50s through the 80s, and then he got into juicing. And I mean, what just what an inspiration he was. And so he, to me, like Jack LaLanne is the perfect model to to aspire to of somebody who lived the life. You know, he ate well, he 
took his supplements, he exercised, and then he just expired, basically. I mean, again, unfortunately, there's no cure for mortality, but he lived all the way. He was so active up until just like the last week or two of his life. And that's what I'm shooting for. I mean, I might get run over by a bus today driving home, but at least, you know, that's what I'm aspiring to do. And I, and I want to not end up like my grandparents and even my poor father, all five of them died very miserable, ugly deaths due to chronic disease. And, and so much of it was related to the food that they, that they ate and the food that they didn't eat. And that it contributed to their early and ugly demise. And that's exactly what I'm attempting to avoid and what I, what I want to inspire other people to do. I mean, I get people telling me, I even have a couple of people at the grocery store. Occasionally they'll tell me, wow, you know, John, I, thank you so much for doing what you do. And I really look up to you and I, and I, I'm just encouraged by how you live your life. And I, and I'm trying to do the same. And, you know, that makes me feel really good, much like our research in Alzheimer's. I mean, I had caregivers calling me in tears of joy as we were running that study and, and just talking about how their loved one was doing things for the first time in some cases for years. I mean, it's wonderful to be a great scientist and be ethical and, and do the right thing. But when you can actually touch people's lives and make a difference in people's lives, that's where the rubber really, really hits the road, so to speak. And, and it makes me feel good to be able to help people and, and share this information and, and in some ways be inspirational to people. Yeah, hundred percent. There's no better feeling. There's no better feeling giving people the, the, the little push, the, I believe in you, the, the motivation, whatever it might be to be like, Hey, you, you can do this also. And you, right. know, you have me in your corner to push you that way. And so that's amazing. Um, what, what are the, the most important nutritional, let's say facts, information, or just pieces that you want your kids to take with them when, say, they leave the house or they're on their own or they're making food choices or something like that? That's a great question. <clears throat> First of all, I think hydration is a big issue, right? I mean, I think people are not drinking enough water typically every day. And so people need to shift. You know, soda is such a big problem in our country. People need to shift the way they look at um, hydration. So I think drinking plenty of water every day is is certainly a very beneficial thing. Well, along with pollens tips that you mentioned just a moment ago or guidelines, I think one other interesting thing that I, I can't take for credit for this, but I hear other people saying is eat the rainbow. Like if you don't know too much about how you should eat or what's the best strategy, eat the rainbow. So as many different colors as you can eat, that is giving your body, your cells, the widest uh, range of different nutrients and phytonutrients that they will utilize to function properly. And then fresh, you know, like, does it look as fresh as possible? I mean, something that you can, again, recognize as being a, a, an actual food as opposed to just something that has been processed into something else. I think those are, there's, those are critically important. I think something else that's also uh, very underappreciated in our country is, is our vitamin D status. And it's, now relatively pretty easy to get checked. You, I don't even think you actually need a full blood draw. Some There are some companies offering you can do like a little finger stick or a finger prick, and then you just put that little drop of blood on a little, um, a, a little. Um, it's not a uh, tablet, but it's like a little, I don't know, card or something, and then you just put that drop of blood on there, send it off to the lab and get analyzed. But vitamin D, I was giving a lecture this past fall, and I I was mentioning vitamin D in a couple of points in my in, in my lecture, and uh, it's now been shown that vitamin D has some sort of an interaction with 4,500 of our roughly 40,000 genes, and I'm sure that number is only going to go up as it yeah as it gets more and more studied. So vitamin D is incredibly important. <clears throat> we ran a study also on vitamin D a few years ago before I left academics full time, and. Um, so here we are in South Florida, you know, sunny South Florida, where you think most people are getting plenty of sunshine exposure. And 70 percent, I think we had 100 and I want to say 115 people in that study. And these were, I believe, people 55 or 60 and older. I forget the age requirement, but they were considered, you know, older people. Uh, and 70 percent of those hundred and some odd people were either insufficient or deficient in vitamin D. I mean, that's just such a shame. Like there's no, there's literally no excuse for that. Like you were saying earlier about no excuse for being ignorant at this point in life because of all the information out there. There's no excuse <clears throat> for 70% of Americans to be insufficient or deficient in vitamin D. If you're living in Alaska 
or Montana or Minnesota, like way up north where maybe you don't get a lot of sunshine. That's fine. But guess what? Vitamin D supplements are dirt cheap and they work. Mm. Take your vitamin D3 every day or every week, depending on the dose. Get your vitamin D level up. And it's not just about your bone health. It literally affects every major organ system in our body. So again, that's not just you know, bone health. I mean, a lot of people just think vitamin D, oh, it's for my bones. No, it's it's literally from your head to your toes. So for your children too, you want to make sure that their vitamin D level is sufficient. And of course, that's, well, optim- sufficient versus optimal. Maybe I should make that distinction too. Some people are saying that even just being sufficient is actually not where we should be. Like the level ought to be even higher. It's kind of like vitamin C. You're your recommended daily dosage for vitamin C is what, 90 milligrams? And that's only to prevent scurvy. That that doesn't really optimize your health. That's based on very old data that just says, okay, at this level every day, you won't have scurvy. Okay, well, that's great. No one wants to have scurvy or die from it today. But is that really the amount that we need to optimize our health? I would say that's no, probably not. We probably need more vitamin C. But again, I think, um, uh, you know, vitamin D is such an easy, simple fix for for so many people and yet we're not doing it and then it's leading people down the road of metabolic syndrome and and all these other things not just related to bone health so those are some of the daily things that i would definitely recommend to people and then not to be too much of a self-promoter but again i'd say that the polysaccharides also every day are very important and it's not just about oh well i'm sick now what do i do no it's about preventing these things in the first place i mean i've been taking my own formula for over a decade now I would be a hypocrite if I didn't, because to me, prevention is just as important as treatment. So we don't get these things from food, supplement with them. And they're not, it's not like, you know, such a costly endeavor. I mean, anybody who complains about the cost of dietary supplements, I would say, well, are you the same person that rolls into Starbucks every day and spends eight or nine or $10 on a latte? If you are, you're wasting your money when you could be spending that amount of money on something that would actually benefit your health, not just give you some sense of a, you know, a kick because you need an energy boost or because you like the taste of it. No, spend your money on something that will actually help you with your health, not just for your enjoyment or because you didn't sleep enough last night. Yeah. I mean, if you view it as an investment, then there's no, I mean, there's no greater investment you can make than your health. That's right. There's just none because quality of life uh, is the most important thing. I'm sure you know firsthand people who have all the things in the world. But, oh, I do. But they just, what do they have? They yeah, don't have their that. health. They don't have their happiness. They don't have quality relationships. They've got nothing. And you know people who are, you know, I don't know, the the person who, the mailman or the person who's a grocery store clerk or someone who, like, we think, like, not a cool job, but those jobs are pretty sweet and the world needs those jobs. They are taking care of themselves. They they have great relate, like all these sorts of things. I'm just saying sort of two ends of the spectrum, but like the investment you make in yourself, there's no greater one. Cause that's how you, that's how you get actually get rich. Um, is that you have a quality of life. You live for a long time in the best way possible. Um, I mean, Harvard, Harvard did this 85 year study and they found two results, two results that lead to the good life. And you've, we've said them here all day. One is your quality of health and two is good relationships. That's it. Two things. Yeah. Two things lead to the good life. Like everything is doesn't need to be as complicated as it needs to be. It's very simple. Try and have one, two, or three amazing relationships and take care of yourself every day. Um, the The best Babe Ruth quote about this is that uh, yesterday's home run does not win today's baseball game, right? It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. You got to repeat it again today over and over and over every day for the rest of your life. Um, and so that's really important. And I also want to make uh, one distinction about your supplement is that it's not just for older population. Everyone can take it uh, every single day, right? Absolutely. We've had, so our daughter just turned four a few weeks ago and we started introducing solid food in her diet when she was six months old. I started giving her the polysaccharides then. I would have given them to her right at birth, but unfortunately the uh, when we would feed her you know, she didn't have the capacity to, to you know, at, at birth up until six months, the nipple that we used on her bottle was too, the, the little hole was too small. So I could, mm. they're, and they're pretty big particles. So I couldn't, I couldn't feed them to her then. They wouldn't, they wouldn't actually go through the little hole, but 
But yes, and then my mother, I won't mention her age because she's sensitive about her age, but let's just say she definitely qualifies as elderly. And my wife, while she was pregnant, I mean, it's, it's, there's no, I mean, there is no contraindication for this. I, people ask me all the time, oh, well, you know, is it going to affect my medication or anything else that I take? I'm like, no, absolutely not. You've got to, you know, again, understand nutrition is far different from pharmacology. And, and so these polysaccharides are beneficial for literally every person. If you can swallow something, actually, it's even beyond that. I, there, there have even been, so one of my mentors and all this are my primary mentor, Dr. Reg McDaniel, he's even fed these uh, polysaccharides to people that were in a coma uh, through a feeding tube when they couldn't even swallow and help them actually get out of coma with this stuff. So yes, I mean, if you're wow. still living and breathing, you can take these polysaccharides and benefit from them. Absolutely. Amazing. Amazing. Um, well, thank you, John. I appreciate your time. Um, where should thank people you, go Paul. if they want more of you? They want to buy the supplement. They want to read some of your other blogs and things like that. DrLewisNutrition.com is our primary website. That's the best house of uh, store storehouse of information. We've got all sorts of information that's there, probably more than most people would care to read. And uh, we're on all the typical social media channels as well under DrLewisNutrition.com or DrLewisNutrition. So TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. We're getting started on Twitter too. We haven't been too, doing too much on Twitter yet, but on those other four, we've got lots of uh, video content there. And um, if anyone you know has a question, we've got you can contact me by the um, the email address <clears throat> on the website, or of course they can send a message through the social media channels as well. And I'm always happy to help people and answer questions and clarify anything anyone may have. But we really, you know, if I may just summarize it up, you know, in terms of daily brain care, I mean, I, I consider that our, our company is a bit different, although there are a few out there that uh, are doing it the same way I have, but I'm the person who's, you know, I put my name behind this brand. This, uh, this product is, is my inanimate baby, if you will. Uh, this is based on 20 years of my work. It's based on Dr. McDaniel and all of his colleagues work. So it's literally decades of combined experience that have fueled all of this research in polysaccharides. And I stand behind this. I mean, there's nothing that I sell or that I recommend to people that I'm not doing for myself. And so I think that level of credibility, you know, all the science that I have in my history, I'm not a marketer. I mean, I'm, I'm a scientist who's trying to, to be an entrepreneur, if you will, but I'm not just some sl slick salesman that's just trying to make a buck. I mean, I'm, I'm selling things that actually help people and that I believe in and I put my name behind and I stand behind and that, that I've shown time and time again with our research and even the product reviews. I mean, you can, you, you can read the product reviews and the, the testimonial videos as well. I mean, those are, those are all legitimate. I, no one's been paid to say any of that stuff. So it's all real. And uh, again, if anybody has any questions about authenticity, contact me and I can refer them to other people who can, who can validate it. But I, I stand behind everything that I've said today and, and who I am as a person and, and what I will continue doing for the rest of my life. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Um, everything about John is linked below in the show notes, but thank you, Dr. John. I really appreciate it. And, uh, amazing work. Um, I'm glad that we, I stumbled upon your work. Uh, I'm going to be buying some daily brain care for not only myself, but for my grandma. Um, so the beauty of the podcast, the beauty of connection. So thank you so much, man. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for tuning into that episode. And if you enjoyed it, click right here, right here for another full length episode of the podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe. But most importantly, most importantly, above all else, please, please take good care of yourselves and others. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Cheers.